When it comes to pocket pets, hamsters just might be the most popular animals people own. Their small size, inexpensive purchase price, and availability make them sought after for young children, despite their nocturnal nature and the fact that many of them do not enjoy being handled. Out of the five species of hamsters commonly found in a pet trade, the Syrian hamster is the most recognizable and likely the most popular. Also called the golden hamster, the longer-haired versions have been affectionately dubbed the teddy bear hamster. There have even been hairless versions. All of these rodents, with their wide range of colorations and hair lengths, are the same species, Mesocrocetus areatus. They are so common as pets, it might be easy to forget that wild Syrian hamsters still roam the deserts of Syria, where they were first officially recognized by scientists and where the first founders of the captive population would eventually be collected. Israel Aharoni, a zoologist, set out to Syria in 1930 near the city of Aleppo to locate the elusive, rarely seen creatures. He was seeking Syrian hamsters with the hopes of starting a captive population that could replace the Chinese hamster, which bred poorly in research labs and therefore had to be constantly captured from the wild. After hours of digging, Aruni's team located a mother hamster and her 11 young in a wheat field at a depth of about 8 feet underground. Sadly, once placed in captivity, the mother hamster began to cannibalize her young and had to be removed, leaving 10 young hamsters that were brought to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. However, Aharuni discovered that all of the hamsters escaped. He managed to recover all but one of them. However, once again, they escaped from a wooden box, and after an exhaustive search, only three females and one male remained. Then, sadly, the male killed one of the females. With only three individuals left, the Syrian hamster project certainly seemed destined to fail. However, in what could only be described as a miracle for the scientists, the remaining three began to reproduce prolifically, eventually forming an entire colony of 150 animals. That's right, three hamsters, all of which were siblings, were the original founders of what would develop into the pet trade population throughout the world. The colony Aroni established was distributed to various labs, which also developed colonies, and some of these made their way to the United States. New wild-caught Syrian hamsters wouldn't be collected until the 1970s. Hamsters were largely unknown, strange, wild animals until the 1940s, when Albert Marsh of Mobile, Alabama began selling hamsters as pets after he won one in a wager and obtained more of the rodents, learning how to breed them. He founded Marsh Enterprises and the Gulf Hamstery, which encouraged hamsters as pets for research and as business ventures. He even convinced the state of California to reverse its ban on these exotic creatures. However, in the early 1950s, Marsh's business began to dwindle when hamsters became prevalent in every pet store. Marsh closed his company in the 1950s and got into the quail business. However, hamsters remain one of the most common and familiar pets of today. Therefore, are hamsters domesticated or wild animals? The problem with this question is that domestication is an ill-defined concept and wild is up to interpretation. Hamsters are often considered to be exotic pets, but there is little reason to not consider them to be just as, if not more, domesticated than dogs and cats. The reason for this is that hamsters, unlike dogs and cats, have had their breeding entirely controlled by humans. This type of domestication is referred to as a directed pathway and is the artificial selective process that most people have in mind when thinking about domestication. Alternatively, dogs and cats became domesticated through a commensal pathway, which essentially means they naturally evolved just like wild animals, with human societies being a niche they've adapted to on their own, outside of human control. Not only did humans control the breeding of Syrian hamsters, these animals were forced to breed in the confined conditions of a laboratory setting, further creating a significant selective pressure for adaptation to not only the presence of humans, but captivity. What is remarkable about the Syrian hamster, however, 
is that while the original founder population had absolutely no previous human exposure, as they were sourced from desolate, uninhabited areas, they still managed to proliferate in trying captive conditions. When Aharoni placed the wild hamsters in captivity, natural selection continued to take place, as the hamsters that failed to reproduce had reduced fitness. The three hamsters that did manage to reproduce had pre-existing traits, regardless of not being domesticated, that allowed them to fare well. In fact, one scientist that captured the fully wild creatures in a 1970 expedition described them as excellent pets. After only three days of handling, the wild hamsters I captured in Syria were tame and gentle. All of the animals mated within four weeks of being captured, and all eight females produced litters. And I believe it had changed very little from the wild type, especially with respect to its behavior, because the wild type was originally well suited for the laboratory. While Syrian hamsters are actually considered to be vulnerable in the wild and are rarely observed, the populations of their domesticated counterparts are surging. Just like other domesticated species, they come in different colors, including those which mirror patterns cited in the theory of domestication syndrome. It is highly unlikely that after numerous generations, especially with extensive inbreeding, that captive hamsters do not differ genetically from wild hamsters, making them undeniably domesticated, no matter which way you define that word. It's possible that we might not be able to detect a meaningful difference between our pets and a hamster newly plucked out of the wild behaviorally, but this just shows us domestication is of little importance. Like other so-called domesticated species, the progenitor of the domesticate tends not to differ dramatically, as is often thought. Hamsters also show us that wild animals can be domesticated in controlled settings, regardless of their rarity or lack of previous adaptation to anthropogenic environments. Furthermore, some animals can make reasonable pets without any domesticating at all. 